As we've talked about before, the Oracle of Apollo at the Polis of Delphi played a critical role in the politics and religion of central Greece. Delphi was one of many oracular sites throughout the Greek world, such as Olympia, Diem, Delos, and Siwa. Delphi, however, was of particular significance because of its revered sibyls, priestesses, and the Pythia, the Oracle. Her prophetic readings were sought out by many rulers, generals, and ambitious men due to their accuracy and legitimacy. In many ancient Greek tales, the Oracle usually plays the role of foreshadowing later tragedies to come, with sinister accuracy. However, it is suspect whether they were merely an invention of historians and storytellers to give a moral message to their stories. Historically, our knowledge of the process of the Delphic Oracle are unclear and often contradictory. But we know that the Pythia was elected for life from amongst the Sibyls, akin to the Pope in Catholicism. They had to be pious through their sobriety and virginity. We're told by Plutarch, who was a high priest at Delphi for a number of years, that the social status of the Pythia seemed to be irrelevant, as they could come from the noble aristocracy or the stock or peasantry. They could be well learned on the current socio-political landscape of central Greece, or unable to even write their name. Regardless, the legitimacy of the oracle laid more on their divinity and accuracy than their social class. Due to their significance in most facets of religion and politics, the Oracle of Delphi was given special immunity and suzerainty over its lands. This was to stop any one political league from seizing the Oracle and regulating or limiting who could consult her. Thus, the Amphictyonic League was established on most of the tribes of central Greece to protect the independence of Delphi and other holy sites, ensuring that the lands were not grazed, farmed, or seized from them. According to Aeschines, the League originally consisted of 12 tribes across central Greece. The Thessalians, Boeotians, Dorians, Ionians, Pahabians, Magnets, Locrians, Oetians, Theots, Malians, Phocians, and the Dolopians. Each tribe had two votes, but distribution across Greece wasn't so clear. This was largely due in part to the influence of the powers of Thessaly, Athens, and Thebes in central Greek politics. The tribes around the area of the mountain pass of Thermopylae, for example, the Malians, Locrians, and Oetians, were under the influence of the Thessalian League, between them contributing a combined six votes. Along with the four tribes inside the League itself, the Bahamians, Magnets, Thessalians, and Theots, this gave the Thessalian League major sway over about half the votes of the League. However, other tribes, such as the Ionians, Dorians, and Locrians, were not as homogenous in their distribution. The Ionians split their two votes between Attica and the mainland and Eboia off in the Aegean, the Dorians between the Spartans and Laconia, and their central Greek comrades in Doris, whilst the Locrians had their votes split between their eastern and western Locrian counterparts. The intention of this distribution of votes was to give all members of the League an equal voice, but in action, it did not prevent the realities of political prominence of the leading powers of Athens, Thessaly, and Thebes of the time. To understand the events of the Sacred War, we need to look at the political landscape leading up to 356. It all starts to 382 BCE, and what would spark the Theban revolt against the Spartans. The Spartans had seized the Theban Acropolis, the Cadmea, during a truce, a sacrilegious act. Now, to cut a long story short, the Theban revolt turned into a revolution, ultimately resulting in the downfall of Spartan hegemony at the Battle of Leuctra in 371 BCE. The Theban generals of Epaminondas and Pelopidas proceeded to invade into the Peloponnese, liberating the helot slaves of Messenia, restoring the cities of Messene and Megalopolis. However, Thebes' sudden rise to prominence was curtailed after the Battle of Mantinea. That left Thebes war-weary and without their star generals of Epaminondas nor Pelopidas. This was also felt by the other players, Sparta and Athens. Another defeat cemented Sparta's permanent manpower deficit, and Athens became too wary to continue the fight. Hence, a common peace of 362 was signed, leaving a relatively peaceful time between the major Greek powers. Although peace in Greece was not meant to last, and what was typical of the 4th century, it was a tyrant in the city of Foray Thessaly causing troubles. Alexander Foray, surveying the current political situation, aimed to succeed where his father Jason had failed, to dissolve the Thessalian Confederacy, annex Macedonia, and bring about Thessalian domination. It would seem too that his timing was ideal to realize his plans. Thebes being too war-weary to intervene, did not answer the Thessalian allies' call to arms. Thus struck with civil war and abandoned by its Theban allies, they had nowhere else to turn to than to the Athenians. 
See, Alexander had also struck the Athenian possessions in the Cyclades as to diminish their presence in the Aegean Sea. His attacks went so far as to raid the defended port of Athens herself, the Piraeus. So Athens was all but too happy to come to Thessaly's aid and conclude an alliance for all time. The civil strife still dealt a significant blow to the League, even with Athens' aid, as it weakened the Amphictyonic League's most prominent member. An exhausted Thessaly would be unable to properly safeguard the Delphic Sanctuary from political bullying from its neighbours. Its sway over the votes of its small southern neighbours diminished. Thus Delphi was on the lookout for a new ally to safeguard the sanctuary and to support its political interests. Sparta was out of the question, as by this point it was but a rump state, depleted of manpower and influence, barely able to protect its power outside of the Peloponnese. Athens then would seem to be the next best candidate, but Delphi and Athens were on less than speaking terms. For a couple years prior in 363 during political instability in Delphi, called Stasis, the head archon of the city had banished Astacrates, an ambitious pro phocian politician, fearing that he may seize the city with Phocian help. Athens, then at war with most of the Amphictyonics anyway, accepted the exiles giving them citizenship and exemption from taxation. This left Thebes as the most obvious choice for Delphi's new ally. The oracle bestowed the Thebans the right of Hermantia, priority in consulting the oracle above others. This was only otherwise given to the Spartans for liberating the sanctuary in the 5th century. Such honour came with the unspoken obligation to remain worthy of it, to ensure Delphian liberty. As such, Delphian affairs became a new priority for the Thebans, as we shall see in 357. During the Autumn Palais, the meeting of the Amphictyonic Council of 357, Thebes was to flex its newfound power and condemn the Spartans for seizing the Cadmia illegally during a time of peace way back in 382. As we know, the Spartans were obviously guilty, but as to why they sought further retribution 25 years after the fact is less obvious. For the Thebans had already crushed them in the field and robbed them of their hegemony. In all regards, the Spartans had already paid in full. The aim of Thebes then was to hurt them diplomatically and ostracize them from their allies in the Peloponnese. For refusal to pay the fine would be sacrilege. Hence, a fine of 500 talents was placed in the Spartans, which was due by the next year Palais in the spring of 356. But why now? Well, the time of the indictment came shortly after another one by the Delphians. And here we see the power play by an emboldened Delphi to use its newfound ally to its benefit. See, Delphi naturally lay in the area of focus. Therefore, its biggest threat to autonomy was typically the Phocian Confederacy. Therefore, when Phocus began to cultivate the Cahayan Plain, where the sacrificial cattle were grazed, they too saw themselves in the crossfire, as they too were guilty of and fined 500 talents for violating Delphi's autonomy and cultivating religious land. Both Delphi and Thebes were pleased, as both their enemies were indicted and brought to heel. Now, to say the fine was impossible to repay is a bit of an understatement. To give a perspective on the sheer size of this fine, the Athenian Empire back in the 5th century had the gross worth of about 490 talents annually. Phocis, on the other hand, was never a particularly rich region and nothing in comparison to the Athenian Empire. Hence, even if they had every intention of paying back the fine come spring, it would not be possible without completely crippling their confederation. Come the Spring Palais of 356, the matter of unpaid fines was raised, with Phocis and Sparta having to answer for defaulting. Delegates of the Phocians pleaded against the council the injustice of the out of proportion fine to their crime, however to no avail. In fact, the council doubled the fine, and that of Sparta's as well, to 1,000 talents in total, more than the Spartans had at the victory at the end of their Peloponnesian War. The Amphitione gave them, again, until the next Palais to pay up the fine or else. And so the Phocians and Spartans were driven to resistance. Stasis broke out in the Confederation on what to do. In the chaos, the distinguished orator Philomelos offered a solution. To defy the Amphitione and dismiss the unjust verdict by affirming their ancient presidency on Delphi and the council. In order to enact his plan, he proposed to make himself Strategos Autocrator and his ally Onomakos Strategoi. Together, they would have absolute power over all matters in the Confederacy. Philomenos' proposition was quite popular given the dire circumstances. 
but it was not without opposition against such sacrilege, although this was brutally crushed. In charge, he began to seek out support for his resistance. Naturally, he first sought out the Spartans and journeyed there personally to meet King Archidamus. They both obviously had interest in the removal of the fine, however, open Spartan support couldn't be made for such an impious act, although the king alone could patronize Philomelos outside of the state and did so, giving the Phocian cause 15 talents and most importantly, his support. All the risk then was with the Phocians and none with the Spartans. Archidamos' 15 talents were enough funding to kickstart the Phocian war effort. Philomelos levied a small portion of the confederacy, 1,000 peltas, and supplemented the rest with mercenaries. The Theban and Delphians had achieved their petty revenge, but in doing so, forced their hand and the beginning of the Third Sacred War. In July of 356, Philomelos made the first strike, marching on Delphi before the fines were due in the Autumn Palais. He slew the noble families that opposed him, but otherwise spared the populace of the city, although only when persuaded by Archidamos to do so. The first to counterattack the Phocians were the Locrians to the west from Amphissa. However, this force was soundly crushed outside of Delphi by Philomelos' mercenary troops. The Locrian prisoners from the battle were, in an act of unusual cruelty, thrown off a cliff, the capital punishment for sacrilege. Philomelos was laying claim to Phocian presidency of Delphi. For those who opposed him, opposed the god, and would be punished accordingly. In this vein, he reasserted that the verdict against Spider and Phocus was unjust, and had the tablets bearing the charges destroyed. Next, he went about setting up a more cooperative government in Delphi, and for this, he returned Astacrates and his supporters from exile. This helped twofold, as Astacrates, as we mentioned beforehand, had been living in Athens for the past seven years as an honorary citizen and had secured influential Athenian contacts. Hence, he could persuade the Athenians of the genuine intent of the Phocians, securing support or at least neutrality. Secondly, his pro-Phocian leaning secured his cooperation with Philomelos. Next, Philomelos appealed to Apollo for guidance, insomuch that he coerced the oracle for a reading. Once forced, she told Philomelos that he could do as he wants. Not oblivious to the sneer, he took it on board anyway, and used it as an oracle for free justification to do whatever he wanted. Following this, Philomelos organized a bogus meeting at Delphi, reiterating the approval of Apollo, and recommended that they send embassies to the other Greek states to show their pure and just intentions. He even offered to give a full account of all the Delphic treasury, and claimed to not want to seize any of it. Clearly, Philomelos knew he was unlikely to gather support for Phocus, but rather sought to take support away from the Amphictyoni. In Sparta, their actions were met with obvious support. With as little as 15 talents, Archidamos had removed the 1,000 talent fine, and even possibly gave Sparta an opening to reclaim the Peloponnese. Athens, on the other hand, had little to gain from a war with Thebes unless they were to collapse entirely. However, it still gave Phocus its support despite Thebes at least. Other smaller states such as Achaea pledged some support in the means of 1500 hoplites. In response to Phocian action, Thebes held a special meeting of the council in the autumn of 356 and raised the motion of a sacred war on the grounds of sacrilege against the Phocians. The Locrians, the Thessalians, and the vast majority of the council voted for war and thus the Amphitionic League declared war, which was answered in turn by Sparta and Athens. The declaration of war in autumn meant Philomelos had until the spring before any offensive from the Amphitionic could begin. Since the council consisted of many members, their plan against them was easily intercepted. Their plan was to rendezvous near Boeotia and attack in full force. This force could roughly be estimated to about 6,000 Thessalians and their allies, around 1,000 Locrians, and no more than 6,000 Boeotians, the latter of which is a fair estimate as they never put more than about 8,000 men on campaign at any time before. His rough battle plan was simple, divide and conquer. If Philomelos could raise a large enough force, he could campaign out first and strike out at the Locrians and Thessalians before they merge with the Boeotians, and then meet Thebes herself on the battlefield alone. 
Now, in order to do this, he would have to get a sizable force of around 10,000, and Delphi had given him the means to raise it. See, although Philomenos claimed he wasn't going to plunder the sacred treasury, as far as he saw it, he was merely borrowing from it, up until it would be replenished once he had been victorious. And why wouldn't he justify it this way? He had asserted Phokian presidency over the sanctuary, and the deity himself had given him free reign to do as he wants. Hence, in his eyes, it was only fair to use the sacred treasury to defeat the heresy. Although many regarded this as an affront to Apollo, and to them who had donated to its treasury. To see how expensive it would have been, let's do some quick maths. We know from Xenophon, a historian and infamous mercenary commander of the 4th century, the one regular daily pay for foot mercenary is one drachma. However, Philomenos had to increase his pay to one and a half to draw more mercenaries, as even they had some objections to the seizure of the treasury. Daily pay then, for 10,000 mercenaries, would have been up to 15,000 drachma, about two and a half talents. Monthly pay to 450,000 drachma, equivalent to 75 talents, and yearly to 900 talents. Hence, we can see the absurd cost of this war that could only be paid by plundering the treasury. The beginning of the campaign came to a head in the spring of 355, when word came to Philomilos that the Boeotians were ready to march. He had to act, and act fast. Leaving a garrison at Delphi, Philomilos marched against the eastern Locrians, before the Achaeans could even come and supplement his forces. The Phokians marched around Mount Calodromon to the plain around the city of Argolos, catching the Locrians by surprise. The Locrians charged against the Phokians with the cavalry, however, they were soundly defeated, but it did buy enough time for the Thessalians and their allies to arrive on the scene from the north. Outnumbering both armies, Philomenos immediately gave battle to them. Although both armies were defeated, Philomenos didn't get the crushing blow he wanted, as the Thessalians gave the Locrians a window to retreat to Argolos, sparing them from annihilation, and the defeated Thessalians also fled to the city. Philomulos then, was in the awkward position of besieging the polis before the Boeotians under Pamenes could arrive and seriously threaten his army. A small relief came to Philomulos when the Achaeans arrived with their 1500 hoplites, although so did Pamenes. The arrival of Pamenes reinforced Amphitheonic numbers to be about equal to that of the Phokians and their allies. The situation was looking dire for Philomenos. Faced with an army of roughly equal size to him, holding a fortified position and under a star commander, he knew that it was best for him to withdraw and that his plans had failed. Undisclosed to the Amphitheonic army, Philomenos and his men managed to retreat over Mount Calidromon to the town of Tithronian in focus. Once they had caught wind of the Phokian escape, Parmenes ordered a hasty march to the south to try and cut them off in the Cephisos Valley in case they were trying to attack into western Boeotia. Traversing through the Frontana Pass, the Amphitheonic army had found the shortest route. However, Philomenos' head start resulted in both armies clashing near the Acropolis of Neon. Battle had started immediately. Philomenos and his troops were likely stationed closer to the foot of Mount Parnassos as they had arrived earliest, while Pamenes would have been approaching from the valley plains before the city. The details of this battle are lost to us, and the information we do have are lacking. We do know that this was a complete victory from the Amphitheoni. The Phokian forces were pushed up the wooden slopes of Parnassos, taking heavy casualties as they began to break rank. In the retreat, the forces were split up, and Philomenos was cornered to the edge of a cliff face. Badly wounded and trapped, Philomenos threw himself off the cliff face, the fate for temple robbers. His right-hand man, Onomakos, managed to flee with some remnants of the mercenary forces across the mountain and back to Delphi. The Battle of Neon was a crushing defeat for the Phokians, yet oddly enough, Pamenes did not follow up this victory with the siege of Delphi but rather retired back to Thebes. This was a perfect chance to end the sacred war and crush the Phokian cause then and there. As we shall see, the respite would allow Onomakos to recoup his losses, and such an opportunity to finally crush the Phokians would only come once Philip II had brought the full force of Macedonia upon them.